interesting footnote. Thank you for your contribution. En dan kom ik tot de volgende. And this brings me to the next speaker that we would like to invite to the stage. Steve Cooper mentioned his name. He's the director of UL Underwriters Laboratory. And the subjects that we referred to earlier on, uh, fire safety and safety of uh, civilians, are very important. And you've got to do your best to. Um, defend those interests. And Steve is going to talk to us about research and why should we study fires. And it's a rhetorical question, but I'm looking forward to it. The floor is yours, Steve. Thank you very much, Chief. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about really bringing the groups together that are in this room right now. The importance of having the fire safety engineering community, the fire research community, the academia, as well as the fire service coming together uh, to learn together to get the most out of that. And uh, I've been blessed in my career where my job is, for the most part, to burn buildings down. Uh, should put me in jail, but when you're doing it for the fire service, it becomes okay. And uh, translate that knowledge to the fire service in a way that they can use it to make themselves safer and more effective on the fire ground. I run a group at UL uh, where we're, you can see our mission here. Our, our mission is not to develop new technology. Our mission is not just to test things. Our mission is to increase the knowledge of the fire service so they can greatly impact their communities around the world. And I've had a, a great pleasure to be able to uh, share this information around the world and uh, as you can see with the, the partnership that we've formed here, uh, the importance that fire does not know where it is. Uh, fire is physics. Fire translates very well. Uh, while the buildings might be slightly different, the tools that our firefighters have might be slightly different, uh, we do all speak a common language, and that's understanding fire dynamics. So we hope to play a, a huge role in getting the information out so we're not repeating uh, what each other are doing because there's not enough resources to go around. Uh, so if we can conduct some experiments and learn some knowledge in the US and that can be a benefit in the Netherlands or Belgium or Germany or wherever, we want to make sure that, that that information is put to the, the best use. We've been lucky in that uh, our federal government puts a large amount of money forward, relatively speaking, uh, to benefit the fire service. And here uh, I can give you a list of the projects that we've worked on, and it's while I have 40 minutes, I could spend 40 days uh, talking about the essentially an excess of $10 million worth of firefighter research that we've conducted to date. But you can see here that we've uh, looked at different construction practices, and I'll talk about some of that as we go through. We looked at what firefighters are exposed to in the smoke, understanding what's in the smoke, almost developing a fingerprint based on what's burning. Looked at ventilation. What happens when the fire department shows up and they open a door, or an occupant leaves a door open, or a window gets broken? What happens with solar panel systems, photovoltaic systems? This is a newer technology that's been introduced into the, the built environment. What was the fire service told on how to interact with those systems? It should not take a firefighter being killed or severely hurt before we begin to pay attention to that. If it's being put into their work environment, they need to know about it. And then we need to know about it uh, in, a, in a very practical way. Basement fires, a uh, very challenging situation we have in, in the U.S. specifically. Uh, we have a lot of basements, and fighting those basements can be very challenging. We wanted to learn more about it. Vertical ventilation, what happens when a, a skylight breaks or the fire department cuts a hole in the roof? How does that change how fire grows and spreads? We've had tremendous number of partnerships, uh, most notably uh, with the fire department of New York, the largest fire department in the United States. Uh, they want answers, and uh, they've had many firefighters injured or killed, and the obvious questions become why. What can we do to learn from those to make sure we don't repeat those, those tragedies? 
Then we looked at uh, our currently finishing up a project right now on exterior fire spread. And uh, we're focusing on the residents. Clearly, there's been a number of high-profile uh, commercial fires uh, or large uh, high-rises where the fire is started on the outside. And because of new sheathing materials for aesthetics and for environmental purposes, those fires have spread completely up the outside of the building, clearly not the intended uh, result. Uh, positive pressure ventilation. We're doing these experiments in January. We're looking at the fire department's use of fans. And again, here's, here's an example of a technology that's been used in the fire service for beyond 30 years. We've been using it for 30 years, but we still don't know the benefits and the limitations. We believe that we understand what some benefits and limitations are, but in many cases, this is a, a piece of technology that gets used all the time. It might be used at every fire a fire brigade goes to. Well, should it be used every time? Is it something that should be used under certain circumstances? Or is it something that should universally be deployed? And uh, we don't really know the limitations of that. And the places to learn those limitations are not on emergencies. You should not be figuring out how to use a tool during someone's house on fire. We should have better ways to learn those things. And I'm going to explain the, how, to, how we have uh, gone about that. We're looking at understanding water uh, based on how water comes out of a hose line and how that hose line gets moved. Uh, how does that impact occupant survivability? How does that impact firefighter safety? The flow rates used, the amount of water used to extinguish a fire, for the most part in Europe, is an order of magnitude smaller than the amount of water used in the United States. Why is that? Just because the ha we have the water doesn't mean we should use it. What's the most optimal way to use it? What's the balance between firefighter safety and property damage or effectiveness? These are things that we don't know too well. The fire service has been using water for hundreds of years. However, we've never really researched it to the point where we have a lot of knowledge that we can use. We have experience. We don't necessarily have knowledge. And then uh, a emerging issue that we're beginning to look at quite a bit is heart attacks and cancer. Uh, we kill an order of magnitude larger number of firefighters due to cancer than we do to operationally on the fire ground. So as opposed to the direct immediate impact, well, what does the impact of firefighters fighting fire have over a lifetime? Firefighters should be able to enjoy their retirement and not have to worry about uh, getting diseases as a result of their occupation. So you can see a pretty diverse uh, set of topics. And uh, this gives you an idea of pretty much a snapshot of each one of these projects. Uh, we're talking, we're not talking about candle flames, we're not talking about small rooms. We're talking about burning full-size structures, actual structures, with hundreds of channels of measurements to really begin to quantify and understand the fire environment. So there you can see collapse in the top here. Measuring smoke particulates, we would ride with the Chicago Fire Department and take measurements at actual fires. This is looking at horizontal ventilation. Here's solar panel systems where we took a number of different technologies of solar panel systems, lit the fire inside the structure, let it get into the panels, lit the fire in the panels, let it spread across the panels. When do they stop generating energy? How do they fail? Where do they ground themselves to? What is the shock potential for the firefighters? What happens when the firefighters put water on them? Can they get shocked as a result of putting water in? A whole lot of unknowns that we've been able to provide some answers for. And of course, you can see we burned uh, 20 different buildings in New York City. Uh, we have a very large laboratory right outside of Chicago in the US. Uh, where it's uh, about 40 meters by 40 meters by 20 meters, uh, where we can build structures inside of our laboratory. All of these tests are done inside our laboratory. Uh, exterior fire spread. This gives you a good idea of what our typical construction is in the United States. Uh, wood framed, wrapped in plastic, uh, which is, uh, has the potential to have a lot of fire spread. And then this is the fans that I was talking about. So where are we now? Where have we been in the past when it comes to the fire service? 
Well, our system in the fire service over time has been that we write procedures that tell us what to do, we train on them, we go to fires, we learn at the fire, and we feed that information back into our procedures. So we learn through experience. So the more fires we go to, the better we should get at firefighting, which is a system that is not very reactive and not easy to change. So as changes occur, it becomes very difficult to modernize or update strategies and tactics because you have to go to a number of incidents to experience a number of things to begin to put the pieces together to ultimately figure out what needs to change, what doesn't. And in many cases, every fire is going to go out eventually. Did we do it the best way? And it's very hard to do that when you have many fire brigades with many firefighters, with many different perspectives showing up and interacting with this structure, and you don't get an immediate cause and effect other than the fire went out. It's like, well, could we have put it out faster? Could we have saved more lives? Could we have had less exposure? Could we have used less water? Could we have optimized the number of people? We don't know. It takes a long time to understand that. What we're finding is if we can get a good foundation of fire dynamics, a good understanding of how fire grows and spreads, that makes for better experience. An analogy would be, do we expect a, a doctor, a surgeon, to perform good surgeries if they don't know anatomy? And that's what we're finding is our firefighters don't really understand fire dynamics because they're not taught enough of it. So they're dealing with fire dynamics on the fire ground, not realizing it, and they're having trouble understanding what's going on around them and having trouble improving. And then, of course, with some research, we can make sure that those firefighters are getting really good experience. We can validate that experience and feed that back into the system so we're improving at a faster rate. So we've got a number of challenges and reasons that research is becoming more important today than it has been in the past. First, the number of fires across the world are decreasing. We're having good prevention. We're having better technologies, better smoke alarms, sprinkler systems, things like that. But if you look at the US, if you look at the late 70s to today, the number of fires in our country has been cut in half. Good. However, if we have a system of firefighters that are supposed to learn on the job, how do they learn on the job if they're getting half of the ability to go to those fires? No two fires are the same. That's very true. However, there's a lot of similarities between. If we understand fire dynamics, we can understand the similarities. We can understand what to take away and what not to take away from certain fires. Ultimately, over the course of a, you can go be in a very major city fire department and go to a lot of fires and still have trouble putting the pieces together of what you're seeing in front of you. Because you can go, say, to this fire right here, open the front door, you experience things get better right inside the front door, but don't see that things get worse three rooms on the other side of the house where a potential victim may be. But you saw it get better. So in your mind, you're thinking, well, I'm always going to do this because things got better, when you don't have the ability to see the big picture when you're performing tasks on the fire ground. Another thing we have is technology. We introduce things like better protective equipment, better tools, better breathing apparatus, so firefighters can go places they could never go before and be protected, which means that you can get closer to the problem without understanding what's going on around you because you're being protected from those things. You're being protected from the heat. You're being protected from the smoke. So now you're putting yourself in a position where things could change rapidly and you don't necessarily have time to react because your protective equipment is protecting you. If you don't have the knowledge and ability to predict these things, you can cause a lot of problems. And ultimately, we want firefighters to understand why. Forever ahead has been, this is how you do this. This is how you stretch a hose line. This is how you break a window. This is how you put a fire out. But we haven't taught them the why to go with it. 
So how are you supposed to think and adapt and be a thinking firefighter if you don't understand the why? So we're really trying to get back into our training manuals and teach the fire service the why. And ultimately, that doesn't mean that experience isn't worth anything. It means that experience and knowledge have to coexist. Obviously, the more fires you go to, the more things you see, the more things that you can put into context. But if we can put the knowledge with that context, then we have a really good, strong fire service. And always, you got to know the basics. Our firefighters still have to know those hows. They have to know how to stretch a hose line. They have to know how to safely drive their fire truck. All of that training is still really important, but you've got to be able to implement and put it all together. We have a, uh, we have a saying in the American Fire Service is we have 200 years of tradition unimpeded by progress. And uh, this is what happens when you have a system that's completely based on experience. It's hard to, to change the way you do things. We have another saying is, that's the way we've always done it. And that's kind of become an anchor as to, well, it worked 10 times, so it's clearly going to work the 11th time not understanding why, and maybe that 11th time is not the same. So we can become very resistant to progress and change, but I think we're really, uh, because of the sharing that's taking place around the world, uh, we're beginning to, to fight this, uh, this mindset. So go ahead and start the video. There we go. The other beauty of technology, I can sit at my desk in the United States and watch Dutch firefighters go to work. Um, how they warned you at the beginning, you're on camera as you sit in this room, well, you're also on camera when you're working. On the fire ground, potentially, all it takes is a neighbor with a camera and all of a sudden you're on the internet. So the purpose of this is not to critique the fire service, the purpose of this is to try and understand experience. So I would say these firefighters show up to what I would consider a very basic fire. It's extremely complex, however it's basic. It's a house on fire. There's fire coming out of the openings. You have a fire that is starved for oxygen. You have a uh, situation where as a fire service you have many options. So, what do they do? Where do you put water? What happens if you put water in that front door? What happens to conditions elsewhere? What happens if you put water in the windows? What are you doing to a potential occupant that may be on the second floor? If you see this on the first floor, is it possible for an occupant to be alive on the second floor? What if they're behind a closed door instead of behind an open door? What happens if you break out the second floor windows? What happens if you open the neighbor's door? All of these things are flying through these firefighters' heads on snaps, short times that they need to make these decisions that could be life or death decisions. But ultimately, how do they know? So if they put that fire out right now, they just put water through those front windows, which I assume they're going to do eventually. Um, <laughs> the fire will go out. And again, hey, it's easy to look at this afterwards and say, hey, look how long they're taking. Well, do you understand everything that's going on here? They might be rescuing somebody on the back of the building, but they only had three people. They had to choose, do I rescue that person or do I put water on the fire? And they made a decision. Well, what if they made the opposite decision? The point is, they can't go to a hundred fires that are exactly the same with measurement devices throughout the house so they can see the ultimate impact of their actions. In research, we can. We can go to the same structure on fire a hundred times. I can build this house 50 different times, put 50 different fuel loads or identical fuel loads. I can look at different arrival times. I can look at different tactics, different tools, all of these different things and learn. It's, you can't do that on the fire ground, and we shouldn't expect our firefighters to have to do that on the fire ground. They should understand. We should be giving them the knowledge so they can apply it when it matters, as opposed to trying to figure it out on the fly. 
And that's the advantage of research. To compound the need for research is, firefighters today aren't fighting the same hazards that they had in, let's say, the 1990s. Things are changing. Well, that means they need to change as well. So what's changing? Well, the expectations of the fire service is changing. It's not just about fighting fires anymore. Technology's changing, the fire environment's changing, research is changing, and ultimately things are changing faster than they've ever changed before. So when we're back in this room 10 years from now, we could be talking about very different things based on how things are changing. Fire brigades today, with no more resources, with no more staffing, with no more hours in the day, are now expected to be experts in things well beyond firefighting. We're just talking about houses on fire up to this point. Well, how about how vehicles are changing? We still expect our firefighters to cut people out of cars if they need to be helped. However, look at how vehicles are different today than they have been in the past. Electric vehicles, hundreds of airbags, new electrical systems. Who's teaching our firefighters everything they need to be safe? We can't expect them to go to 10 electric vehicle accidents and learn what to do. What happens on the first nine, they cut the wrong wire and we kill nine firefighters. And it's not till the 10th that they realize, oh, well, we did that nine times and that was the result, so let's try something else. Oh, this one worked. It shouldn't be that way. What are we doing as an academic community, as groups that are able to develop knowledge to support the fire service? And along the way, you're also supporting every person in this room and their safety as well. You can see the list here. It's, it's mind-boggling that in many cases, you talk to many of the chiefs in the room, they probably spend more time dealing with human behavior and the well-being of their members, paperwork, things along those lines. Almost, there's no time left to understand firefighting. In many cases, it's been thought, well, firefighting's been figured out, so now we can put all of our training time into these other topics. It's unrealistic. Technology. If you look at big snapshots like this, we've made unbelievable amounts of progress in the fire service. When you're in the fire service, and I have been for 13 years, it feels like change is really, really slow. However, when you take a big look at it, we've come a long way. We're better protecting our firefighters. We're giving them the tools they need. We're solving their problems with technology in many cases. We're giving them uh, tools to, that are well beyond things we've had in the past. But in many cases, I think we're failing them when it comes to knowledge. We're not giving them the knowledge to know how to best implement all of this technology. The internet is shrinking the world. I have many friends in this room that maybe started with a question over Facebook or Twitter and has become a lifelong friendship and sharing and exchanging of information because of the internet. We're not in this alone. And we need to continue to form partnerships and work together because, again, none of us have the resources alone to be able to really impact the way things need to be impacted. We've done a lot of research on understanding the fire environment, and I want to share a little bit of, of really the American fire environment. We're seeing changes that aren't just in one component, but in several components of our residential homes. They're getting larger. They've got more open spaces. We're removing all the compartmentation. We've got fuel loads that are evolving, more plastics today than we've ever had in the past. Void spaces are changing, building materials are changing. If the builders can use something that is more economical, lighter, more energy efficient, you name it, they're going to do that. Are they going to ask the firefighters what impact it might have on their safety? In many cases, they're not. They're just go ahead and implementing. Our houses are getting closer together and we're seeing a lot of new technologies put in the homes. All of these things put together any one of these components is significant, but we're seeing multiple components put together. 
all leading to essentially conditions changing faster than they ever have in the past, more occupants needing rescue, more danger to the fire service, both falling through floors, uh, getting caught in rapid fire development. It all seems to be, in many cases, working against the fire service. I'm going to show you a few examples. Go ahead and roll the video, please. Here's a comparison that we did in our laboratory. Two rooms side by side. The one on the left has what I call legacy furniture. In our case, this was furniture that's probably somewhere between the 60s and 80s that is made of natural material. So it's full of cotton. Uh, the room on the right is a room that is furnished with materials that you would go up the road to any store, here included, and purchase that has polyurethane foam instead of cotton. It's got different plastic blends instead of cotton or wool and it's going to burn, burn very differently. And you'll see that two things. One, what occupants are being exposed to prior to fire department arrival is very different. The second thing you'll see is the stage of fire that the fire service is going to show up to to begin to operate is going to be very different. And I want you to put it in perspective here. The front of this room is wide open. So there's plenty of oxygen available. We started this with a candle on a sofa. Just place the candle. And you can see, is there enough energy in this legacy room to get flashover, to get it completely involved in flames? Yes. Same potential energy. However, the time frame in which it's released is very, very different today than it used to be. We're not naive. We know the fire service does not show up to rooms on fire. They show up to structures on fire. So here is two houses side by side. Same thing. The one on the left has legacy fuel. The one on the right has modern fuel. Natural materials, synthetic materials. And you're going to see, we're looking at a couple things here. How long does it take for that fire to run out of oxygen? Because again, the front of it's not open. It's closed. And then secondly, when the fire department begins to interact with the structure, so they show up and gain entry, what does that do to the fire conditions? How long does it take to respond to them making an opening? And in this case, they're going to open the front door and they're going to open the front window. You can see there's no longer smoke coming out of here. That's because that fire ran out of oxygen. Once that fire runs out of oxygen, it actually goes from a positive pressure to a negative pressure and begins to try and suck oxygen from around the openings. We open it, and you can see how it responds. Air rushes in, mixes with the smoke, mixes with the unburned fuel, increases the amount of energy being released, and we transition to flashover takes about two minutes. So if you don't put water in that space, things are getting bad very quickly. So the coordination the fire service has to have between making openings and applying water has shrunk over time. Over here, we're coming up on 14 minutes. You could still be sitting on this sofa watching television. It's a very different burning behavior. Now, it's going to take till about 20 minutes until that fire runs out of oxygen and begins to decrease in size. And then just like the other one, we gave it three minutes from when it began to run out of oxygen until we opened it. We're going to do the same thing, and then you're going to look at how long it takes to transition to flashover. It's a very different timeline. In many cases, Firefighters feel that they still have this timeline when reality is this is their new timeline. We go ahead, we perform the same operation. Instead of taking two minutes to go to flashover, it takes eight minutes to go to flashover. So the amount of time that's needed to coordinate is larger, which means fires today are harder to fight than they have been in the past. What occupants are being exposed to 
prior to fire department arrival is very different today than how it has been in the past. And I'll go ahead and speed this up. Here's what the numbers look like. Because again, it's not just doing demonstrations, it's making measurements. So I want you to look at the blue line. The blue line shows temperatures, and I'm sorry for the F, I should have converted it to C. It's back and forth. You measure it in C, then the fire service in the US has no idea what that means. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. This, uh, the US is a metric country, yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> challenge. So you can see here, we hit about 1,100, let's say 500 C before that fire begins to run out of oxygen. When it runs out of oxygen, it drops all the way down to about 250 C before it gets opened, and then look how quickly it flashes over. The oxygen, which is the green line, dropped all the way down to 5% before it began to recover. So you can see how quickly that pendulum is swinging of how quickly that fire grows with those synthetic materials. But when it's in a closed box, you eat that oxygen up very quickly. Versus the legacy, temperatures in red, look how long it takes to get up to here before it begins to run out of oxygen. It decreases, we make an opening, and it slowly goes to flashover. The oxygen is not dropping like it is over here. It's just slowly going down. The burning behavior of natural materials versus synthetic materials, specifically when it's closed up in a house, is very different. We're seeing the same thing on the outside of our structures. This is vinyl. All three structures have vinyl siding. Underneath the vinyl here is plywood. Underneath the vinyl here is polystyrene foam board. It's used as a rigid foam board because it's more energy efficient and it's cheaper than wood. Over here we have vinyl siding over top of polyurethane spray foam insulation. So it's foam, plastic foam foam. Over here it's plastic foam, and over here it's plastic wood. So what we're looking at is we start the fire with a 100 kilowatt burner, so a small fire at the bottom of the wall, and these are pictures in the attic. So we're looking at how long does it take to go from a small outside fire to an attic fire. And what we see here is it happens in less than two minutes. The average response time in the United States is at a, usually at a minimum six minutes. So this is happening well before the fire service arrives. Over here, we now don't have ventilated attics because we're filling it with foam. So it takes 10 minutes to become an attic fire. However, because there's so much more plastic here to burn, this wall is a much larger fire. Over here, it took more than 20 minutes to have this fire get up into the attic space. So you can see, over time, we've created a different hazard. Here's something we're seeing with our building products. We're becoming more efficient. So we go ahead and we, re we have math programs that allow us to calculate how much wood do you really need. So we start using geometries that make sense, like this I-beam right here. That I-beam is just as strong as this solid piece of wood. However, under fire conditions, there's much less of it to burn, so it loses structural stability. We also learned that, well, we can take it a step further. We can optimize by cutting out the pieces of the web that are not needed structurally, so we can run wires and we can run duct work and we can run whatever else needs to run in that floor. Mechanically, it makes perfect sense. However, when it's on fire, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. You can see how we tested it. This is a standard floor furnace. Uh, creates a fire underneath the floor. This is something that is in our codes and required for commercial buildings. So a building like this would require a test like this 
We don't require this in our homes. So what you have is collapse times that have gone from somewhere in the almost 80 minutes down to about six minutes by replacing materials. By going from this to this, we've gone from almost 20 minutes to six minutes. Very, very dangerous from a firefighter standpoint. We're also introducing new technologies. I talked about the solar panel systems. We've had the ability to do a lot of tests with solar panel systems, understanding the hazards to the fire service. Again, a technology that's great from energy efficiency standpoint. It's excellent. However, how are we supposed to learn the hazards? Do we wait till we get a bunch of them on fire and we hurt the fire service and then we make a change? How do we educate the fire service? Are the people that are making these panels coming to fire stations and teaching the firefighters how to operate around them? Not a chance. You're expected to figure out on your own. We can do better. We have to do better. So here's the firefighters' workplace in our country. Houses are getting larger, lots are smaller. We're putting all kinds of more fuel loads in our homes. We're wrapping them in plastic. We're taking away the compartmentation. We're changing all the building materials. Standards and codes and research can't keep up. However, what are we doing for our firefighters? Are we giving them more people? Not a chance. Are we giving them better training? We're trying. Are they changing their tactics? Do they know? When are, how many fires do they have to go to to figure out that some new building material is going to cause them a problem? The system doesn't help that. Research has changed. I used to only be able to, if you look at researchers from the 70s, they could maybe measure like eight temperatures with a giant strip chart recorder with some instruments that filled up an entire room. I can now show up with a box the size of a small suitcase and measure a couple hundred temperatures every second throughout a structure. So we're getting better there. We can take them out in the field. So in summary, what's all this mean? Well, to move forward, we need a better knowledge of fire dynamics. And the fire service isn't going to get it by themselves. They need the research community and the academic community and the fire service to have an open mind enough to bring those people to the table and talk to them. Technology needs to support the system. It can't drive the system. So we can create new technologies to help the knowledge of the fire service, but the knowledge has to come with the technology or we're putting the cart before the horse. And then ultimately, without dissemination, research is useless. Unless we get out and across the world put it in the hands of the firefighters, then it doesn't matter how many houses we burn down. It's very important that we talk to each other and that we share. And there's no reason that the research that takes place in the Netherlands needs to be the same as the research that we're doing in the United States. It needs to go hand in hand and it needs to build on each other because there's not enough resources to go around. And ultimately, we're a lot more similar than we are different. So we can't just say, well, that's fires burn differently in, in the Netherlands. Amsterdam's fires are much hotter than the the fires in uh, Arnhem. No, we can't, we can't live like that. So I think it's a great time. I think these groups of people are coming together and starting to come together and we need to spread this globally. Uh, can't just be these folks in the United States. As you saw from a professor, they're doing tremendous stuff. We shouldn't be doing the same things they are. We should be learning from each other. We should be working together. We should get better together. Together, we make the fire service more effective. All of our research we put out on our website, ulfirefightersafety.com. It's all in one place. We put out videos. We have a number of channels to, that you can go and look at. We're working on translation. My friend Simcoe in, in the audience here is uh, really working on making sure that we uh, take what we're learning in the U.S. And, and put it into Dutch so that we've got the ability to, that does not become a barrier. We've got six free online training programs. And working with our friends uh, Ricardo and, and Renee, we're working on getting this program right here that we did with the fire department in New York translated uh, so it can 
benefit the, the Dutch Fire Service as well. And we're going to try and get that into more hands. These are all free. You can go to our website and take any one of them for free. Follow us on our social media channels. It was awesome to see that the number of people tweeting stuff as I checked the hashtag at the break. We can't, you can only fit 200 people in this room. They're streaming this out to people that want to watch. We can't just make it, well, because I could get there and I could sit in the room is the only way I can learn. So I applaud the efforts uh, to get this information out and I expect to see a whole lot more likes and follows on our uh, social media channels here. Well, I hope that was worth your time and, and thank you very much if you have questions. Steve, thank you very much. I can just even ask the zaal and then ask Steve on this point. I'm going to ask the audience first are there any questions for Steve. You have the floor. Uh, when you investigate something about the mental decisions firefighters make, and why I ask this question, uh, six years ago, we've been, uh, a delegation of the Netherlands has been to uh, New York mm -hmm. to learn about fires in high rise buildings. Uh, we learned a lot about regulation. We also spoke to um, a uh, fireman at the local fire post. Um, he told us uh, firemen make an oath to protect people and property. Uh, and this, I think this is interesting because I can understand that those are the, the goals of your organization. Uh, but if you have your firemen make a personal promise to protect people, I can understand that, but also to protect property. What do you ask of your firemen? And uh, uh, are firemen in the United States prepared not to extinguish a fire if that may be a danger for themselves? And what in relation to that oath what has been nagging for me about the last six years? Uh, sure. No, it's, it's a tremendous question. Be and before you answer be uh, for the translation, I. The, the, the question is, did you do uh, research about uh, the, 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 the way firemen make their, uh, their decisions? Go ahead. That's a, uh, we talk about fire behavior, firefighter behavior is another topic that, again, we need to bring in the, the psychology folks to understand mindset and how minds work and what the research is there. Uh, but exactly what you're talking about is something that we're trying to address is what is the expectation and where does that expectation come from? We do not expect our firefighters to take the same risk for people that they do for property. It's, it will be unacceptable. So how do we give them the proper tools so that they can gauge risk? If they don't understand how the fire is going to change or how the building is going to react to the fire in it, then they're just blindly following procedure. We need to get them, if they have the ability to think, and make good risk-based decisions, then hopefully that, that risk-benefit decision is being made continually throughout the fire scene. Uh, another challenge we have in the, in the United States is you go to one fire station. You happen to be a big one, but you went to one fire station. We have 35,000 fire departments in the United States. We have no one rulemaking organization over all of them. So in many cases, the way I like to do it, we got 1.1 million firefighters, we've got 1.1 million opinions. So it is very difficult to take how one firefighter feels and cast it out. I mean, if I watched that one video from the Netherlands, I would say the Netherlands firefighters take a long time to put out all their fires. I know that's not the case. So it's important that we put things into context properly and we have a lot of work to do there. You're absolutely right. Other questions? Go ahead. Do you, do you see a role for legislation in this discussion as well? I know you've brought together a lot of different people here. Do you see a role for legislation in this discussion as well? I know you've brought together a lot of different people here. For example, that IBM type product, for me, there is an issue of legislation, and the legislators need to understand what potential dangers from what they're allowing to build with. Sure. And that might be European wide or American. Absolutely. The question is is there a role for legislation? Of course there is. Um, how are the legislators supposed to figure out what the problem is? 
So yeah. let's say the manufacturers who want to get this product to market have a lot of voices, especially in lobbying and connections with the government and things like that. So it wasn't until we had a number of firefighters die by falling through these floors that we then got a million dollar research project to not make it opinion. The legislators all the time will say, well, I don't care about your emotional argument. Okay, your five firefighters died, that's tragic. Maybe they should have done something differently until we actually have the data to tell the story that this is how much time we used to have, this is how much time we have now, this is why potentially these firefighters died, and then it doesn't fall on any one body. It's not, you can't legislate the problem out. Firefighters don't know when they arrive since the fire started in many cases. So even though it collapses six minutes after it gets touched by flames, you have no idea where you are in that six minute time frame. So you almost need to understand it and treat them like they all may collapse until proven otherwise. Um, as a result of that research, we got a code passed through legislation with the support of home builders that requires a half inch piece of gypsum board to be placed on the underside of all exposed eye joists and trusses. Um, now it took the death of many firefighters to get there and it's not retroactive. So there's hundreds of thousands of homes out there that don't have the protection. New ones should. So there is definitely a role there, absolutely. Thank you very much. Last question. If not, then I would like to thank you very much for your uh, contribution. And it, 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 it makes us aware that uh, we have a lot to do. And thank you very much for that. Ladies and gentlemen, then it's especially nice to know that the Underwriters Laboratory is our partner in the research now and in the future. That's very comforting. I'm not going to summarize. I wouldn't be able to do that or want to do that, but I'd like to conclude with what's particularly striking, which is that the more you know, the more you realize what you don't know. That's science for you. Science isn't just trying to answer questions, it's trying to f seek out questions following an answer. And that's basically what we're doing here. And I think we've uh, made major progress. We're increasingly gaining insight into how complex fire is. Anybody who has the temerity to say after this session that all we do is throw water on fire has not understood what we're doing because what we're doing is highly complex. Even though we have so many unknowns to work with in our world, we do our very best to find solutions. And I think that uh, today, this afternoon, and tomorrow, we'll have made a major contribution to that effect. I'd like to thank the speakers from this morning. Our program this afternoon reveals, that we, reveals where you need to be to attend which workshop you've registered for. Workshop one is the ambition. Our speaker will be Rudolf Mirlo. Workshop two, in will be in here to Brauersal with the speaker is to, to, Tobias Brugger. Workshop three, the speaker is Ruth von Herpen, uh, 